All right, so hello everyone, and welcome to our first video. Now, I told you before that each week on Edmodo, I'm gonna put up a review video. This one's gonna be a little bit different. I've also decided that um, because so many kids are out with the flu, and because we keep having days where you know things are interrupted, like today we have the performing arts, so six period, I'm not gonna see you guys. Um, what I'm gonna start doing is also on days that I lecture, I'm gonna start putting up videos like this one where I'm going to go through whatever we got in class. So um, this video right here is going to be about World War II and sort of the beginnings of World War II and the sort of everything that happened with that. Um, and so this is trial run, you know, be gentle. If it's not perfect, um, I'll get better as we go. But, um, you know, we'll see. Hopefully you will feel like this will help you get caught up if you're out or, um, you know, if we don't have class. So anyway, I'm going to talk really fast. Hopefully we, this won't be the longest video you've ever seen. All right, so here we go. So uh, World War II, what we know is that the previous unit that we talked about was the Great Depression. And we know that during the Great Depression, it starts on uh, October 29th, 1929 is sort of the of official day that the Great Depression starts. We know that that is uh, the day the stock market crashed. But we know in Georgia, we actually had other problems already to where Georgia was going through a depression even before then. We know that Georgia was having a problem with uh, the boll weevil destroying the cotton crop. We know that Georgia was going through droughts. We know that there was massive droughts going on out west with the Dust Bowl. Um, so it wasn't just the uh, stock market crash, but it, that was sort of the symbol that started uh, uh, the official sort of Great Depression start. So uh, we know that the Great Depression lasts from 1929 all the way to 1941. And the event that happens in 1941 that technically ends the Great Depression is World War II because the United States gets involved in World War II after December 7th, 1941. That's Pearl Harbor. That's a date you have to know. It's gonna be on a previous, a next slide and I'm gonna highlight it and you have to know it, okay? Now, uh, this right here, um, on this first slide, I have some of the most sort of famous pictures I could think of from World War II. Uh, and so remember that World War II, you know, that's the one where we're fighting Hitler. So um, some of the things that I would want you to sort of be able to identify from World War II just from this picture, these pictures on here. Um, this first one, obviously, that's the Nazi flag. Um, that was sort of the symbol of Hitler and the Nazis. It's the swastika with the white circle and the red backdrop. Um, this right here is the men storming the beaches on Normandy, the U.S soldiers showing up to try to liberate France, because remember, France had fallen to Hitler um, by the time the U.S. gets involved in the war. This picture right here is the bombing of Nagasaki. Um, this is um, only the, this is the first time and the only time the atomic bombs have been used in war. Uh, remember that the United States had these weapons, sort of, they were secretly making them, and so we're going to talk about that. Um, and then this right here is the flag being flown in Iwo Jima, one of the most famous uh, images from the war, maybe one of the most famous photographs of all time. This this was, you know, after the men fought this hard-fought victory, uh, this allowed them to sort of move into Japan and start to end the war. So this is towards the end of the war. Okay, so I've got to erase all this, and then we can move on to the next one. All right, so uh, what we've got right here is um, sort of the beginnings of the war. And so I'm going to highlight some things as we're going along and make sure that on your notes, because those are going to be on uh, Edmodo as well, that you are uh, writing things down, you are highlighting things uh, so that you're just like you are in class. Okay, so here we go. Um, like I said, World War II, this is the one with Hitler and the Nazis. Every year I've taught this, I've always had kids. Is that World War I or is that World War II? It's always World War II. All right, so what you need to know from this slide is World War II lasts from 1939 to 1945. The event that sort of marks the beginning of World War II is um, is uh, Hitler's invasion of Poland. Once they attack Poland, the Russians sort of declare war and the British and the French, and they all start you know, sort of joining in. So that sort of signifies the beginning, and that's in September of 1939. But the United States stays out of World War II at the beginning of the war. So um, we don't get involved until 1945 with the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now you have to know the date that Pearl Harbor gets attacked. That is December 7th, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. Um, if you were alive at that time, that's one of those dates where you know where you were when that attack happened. Um, those people, you know, like, uh, you know, people who were alive during September 11th, they know where they were when September 11th happened. Um, I don't know if you have those kind of dates in your life, or, you know, you know where you were when that event happened, but this was a big deal because after this attack, the United States enters into uh, World War II full force, and we are there for the remainder of the year, uh, or for, of the war, sorry. Okay, so, 
Um, how did we get to that point, though? Because remember, World War one was supposed to be the war to end all wars. We weren't supposed to have another world war, but it did happen. So what were the conditions that led to Hitler, that led to him taking over Germany, and then led to him trying to take over Europe and eventually get us to World War II? So what happened? And the reality is the event that sort of led to World War II was the end of World War I and the way that the Germans were treated as uh, World War I was coming to a close. So the treaty that officially ended World War I was the Treaty of Versailles, and I have that here for you. The Treaty of Versailles, Versailles is a place in France, it's this big fancy castle that they built, um, but when it was time for the Allies, you know, the United States, France, Great Britain, to get together and sort of work out the terms for Germany's surrender, um, they met at Versailles, which is why it's called that, and basically what happened was, the United States went there, uh, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, he had this plan that he called the 14 points. And part of the 14 points was that he did not want um, the Europeans to punish Germany for the war because he knew um, that if they did that and if Germany was you know, going through a hard time as a result of their decision, that it would, uh, could eventually lead to another war down the line. If you remember, after the Civil War, Lincoln wanted to welcome the South back into the Union as friends. He did not want to punish them severely like the Radical Republicans did. So that kind of shows you know, that these themes sort of follow throughout history in multiple ways. Well, if you, you got to think about it. The United States, we were only in World War I for about a year. We didn't get attacked at home at all. Um, and so we did not have the same sort of animosity, the same anger towards Germany that the French and the British would have had. So what ends up happening is um, the British and the French are not having it. They want Germany, you know, they, they're seeing red, they're furious, and they want Germany to be punished. And so what they decide to do is, um, and the United States got outvoted here, is they decide that Germany is going to have to give up some of the land uh, that they owned. So Germany's sort of borders are going to shrink and Hitler's going to, when he takes over, is going to try to get that land back and he actually gets way more than that. Um, they are told that they are no longer allowed to have a military. So the Treaty of Versailles says no German military. And then the last one is right here where I said it made them pay a whole lot of money, reparations, which was a word y'all saw on your test last time. Uh, reparations means repayment. So they thought that Germany should have to pay financially for the entire war, that they should have to pay to rebuild the Allies, they have to, should have to pay for all of the damage. Um, and Germany was a wealthy country at this time. The problem is, is that their country was destroyed too, um, and they did not have the money, the, you know, the billions and billions of dollars to rebuild all of Europe and also to rebuild themselves. So this Treaty of Versailles is going to make the German people furious because they're not allowed to have a military, their lands are being taken away, so if you lived in those lands, you were no longer allowed to be there. But then, on top of that, your economy was destroyed. The Germans actually went through what was called hyperinflation. Their money basically became worthless. There are some very, very famous pictures, and I actually have a few of them on the next slide, of people who couldn't afford, you know, they had you know, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars, but then that money became so worthless that you'd have to take a Wilbro full of cash just to go to the grocery store and buy a loaf of bread. Um, it, they went through this thing called hyperinflation, where basically the value of their money just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping until it was worth nothing. And it was because of all of these reparations that they were having to pay, and they just could not pay that money. Um, and so life in Germany was very, very miserable because of the Treaty of Versailles, and that's what ends up leading to World War II. Because when you have this guy, this charismatic guy, and remember charismatic just means like energetic and somebody that you want to follow, um, with Hitler, gets there and he says, I can fix the economy, I can make Germany powerful again, I can make Germany respected again and basically uh, the German people flocked to him because he said hey I can I can fix the problem I can make sure you have food on the table and make sure you have a job and things like that so that's why he was able to do all of the terrible things he was 
you know, he did, it was because the German people felt like they were abandoned by the Treaty of Versailles and that their life was terrible because of these other European countries. So um, anyway, I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, let me erase these because I have to erase them one by one, unfortunately. Hopefully I'll come up with a better way to do this in the future, but this is what we got for right now. So uh, what you got here, if you're looking at these pictures that I have on these slides, um, what we have here is this is a young man who is literally taking the money that his family has and it's so worthless that he's just pasting it to the wall. He's using it like wallpaper because it's just not good for anything. Remember that was hyperinflation. The value of their money keeps going down and down and down. Uh, this right here, um, th these children, they are literally using, um, you know, uh, bundled together uh, German marks as building blocks. They're just playing with it. It's toys because, you know, it's not worth anything. Uh, this guy right here, he has a wheelbarrow full of money. He's probably going to the grocery store, um, hoping to, you know, get something for the money that he has. So remember, this is just the treaty completely destroyed Germany's economy to the point where these people just couldn't make a living anymore. Um, so let's start going through some of this new information that we've got here. So it says the Treaty of Versailles had destroyed Germany's economy. We got that. The people of Germany were struggling and Hitler promised to make things better. I would highlight that. You would want to know this is why Hitler was able to take power. Um, also, when Hitler starts to gain popularity, then he has to um, sort of explain to the German people, what is he going to do? And he basically starts blaming the allies, you know, uh, Britain and France and Russia and the United States. And he's saying th this Treaty of Versailles, this is the problem, which is why the German people supported him when he started trying to expand throughout Europe and taking over some of these countries. Um, but he also started to focus in on other groups in, in Germany, and you guys know where this is going, because he also started to focus in on the Jews. And so one of the reasons why he, um, you know, went after the Jews, because you guys know the Holocaust happens during this time period, you know, six million Jews are, are killed uh, during that time. And what we know is that Hitler focused on them because they were a minority group. They're a small group of people in Germany. Um, most of the people were not Jewish. And uh, he could sort of use them as the scapegoat. He could use them as the sort of uh, you know group of people who were causing all of Germany's problems. And he was basically saying that they were greedy, that they were hoarding the money, that they're the reasons why the people in Germany didn't have any money or any food. Um, and so he um, sort of turns the people of Germany against the Jews, which is what allows the Holocaust to happen. It's, he's sort of lumping them in with sort of the reasons why the German people are struggling. Um, and remember, Hitler had this whole idea about what he called the Aryan race, this uh, you know, group of people, uh, you know, white people, blonde hair, blue eyes, um, you know, healthy, you couldn't have physical disabilities or mental disabilities uh, in Germany or you were going to end up in the concentration camps as well. And so those groups of people, um, you know, that was what he wanted. And if you weren't a part of that group, you know, he uh, would, you know, send you off to these camps. So anyway, let's keep going. Um, after Hitler takes control of Germany, the first thing he does is he starts secretly building up the German, uh, the German um, military. And remember, they weren't supposed to have one. But he had the factories going day and night, you know, building guns and tanks and bombs and U-boats or whatever it was he needed uh, to, you know, begin his conquest of Europe. He had his people working. And that is a big, big deal because you got to remember the United States during the 1930s, Great Depression. Uh, that depression was worldwide. The British, the French, the Russians, everybody in Europe was going through this depression. And Germany was as well. But then Hitler seemingly turns it around. Okay, so the next thing we have to talk about is, you know, how does Hitler go from taking control of Germany, um, you know, how does he go from building up the military to starting to expand and trying to take over Europe? So if you look at this map right here, all of the red obviously is the territory that the Axis powers take during World War II. And what you can see is that Germany is right here. I'm going to write in blue. Um, right here manages to go from that one small area to taking over most of Europe. So how do we get to that point? Um, one of the things that we have to talk about is this um, belief that Hitler comes up with. Well, you know, one of the things that he starts telling his people and starts sort of uh, telling the other European countries as he's you know, expanding into them is he comes up with this idea that he calls the Lebensraum or the living space uh, in English. And basically what this means is that uh, Hitler is saying that he wants back 
all of the territory that was taken from Germany after World War I, um, and he's saying that the German people need uh, room to grow um, or room to expand. You know, he's trying to make this German empire. And it starts off just taking back the territory that was taken away, but as time goes on, obviously looking at this map here, you can see that Germany uh, expanded way, way past that. Um, but how did that happen? Because he wasn't even supposed to have a military. Why didn't the French, why didn't the British, why didn't the Russians step in and stop him? Um, and it's because at the beginning of the war, uh, at the beginning of this sort of expansion, um, the British specifically and the French had this sort of plan to appease Hitler, or sometimes you'll see this uh, down as appeasement. And basically what this means is that when Hitler would expand Germany's borders, um, the British and the French would talk to him and say, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be doing this, you're not even supposed to have this military, but we don't want to go to war. As long as you'll promise that you won't expand any further, we'll let it go. Um, and they did, weren't able to sort of, uh, they, or they were not, they were not able, but they were not sort of willing uh, to stop him early on. And it makes perfect sense why that is. You know, uh, the United States in the 1930s, we were going through a depression. Um, the British, the French, the Russians, they were also going through a depression. Uh, caused by World War One, and their countries were destroyed after the war. Um, they were, you know, struggling to rebuild, and they didn't know if they could survive another war, if their people would support another war. Um, and so they were sort of hesitant. They were gun shy about trying to stop Hitler. And if they had, uh, maybe things wouldn't have gotten as bad as they did. But you know, we can't go back in time. So uh, what we know is that the official start of World War One is. Uh, September 1st, 1939. That is actually the date that uh, Germany in officially invades Poland. So that sort of marks the beginning of our war. Um, and remember, the United States, we are not involved in 1939. What we know is that uh, we are neutral, but were we truly neutral? We know that in World War I, the United States was selling weapons and, uh, you know, at first to both sides and then just to the Allies. And we know that we basically followed the same plan with World War II, and we're going to get to that in just a second. But um, 1939, the Euro you know, Europe basically goes into World War II, but not us. Um, one of the things that I do want to talk about is this right here before we get into uh, you know, the United States is um, early on, um, Germany actually tried to stop the Soviet Union from getting involved in uh, their sort of expansion. And uh, the guy who was in charge of Russia was a guy named Joseph Stalin. And uh, Hitler actually made a peace agreement called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact uh, to try and stop um, to try and stop the Soviet Union from interfering with you know, their expansion. Basically, Hitler promised he would not invade Russia. He would not mess with anything that was owned by Russia. And in return, uh, you know, Russia wouldn't get involved. Well, it's very simple to figure out why he did that. If you look at this map right here, you know, Germany is right here. It's circled in blue. But what we know is they're fighting mostly on the Eastern Front. And that he wanted to try to avoid a two-front war because remember, Russia is over here. And so if he was going to win that, um, it would be much easier to win if all he had to do was focus over here. Um, by getting the Russians involved, now Hitler has a two-front war and he's having to split his uh, sort of forces between both sides. And you know that weakens your whole entire army. So originally, uh, we know that uh, Russia was not going to get involved in the war until Hitler starts to to expand into Poland and eventually tries to take into Russia. So um, that is something that I do need you guys to know. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more once we get into sort of the um, sort of mechanics of the war and what happens. But uh, that sort of just wants you to know that. Next, uh, what I have on this slide right here, this is um, just sort of a list of both sides of the war. We've got the allies, that's the good guys, that's us. That's Britain, France, the United States, the Soviet Union. And then the Axis powers, those are the um, bad guys. That's uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan. And so you need to know which countries were on each side of the war. And obviously, these are not the only countries that were involved in the war from that map that you saw previously. You know, this thing was going on all over Europe except for Switzerland. And then, of course, Africa, Northern Africa, there was, uh, you know, fighting going on down there. Um, if you look at this uh, slide, I've got pictures of each of the sort of major uh, players. Um, 
from each of these countries, so the leaders. And so what you see here, uh, this guy right here in the top hat, that's Winston Churchill. He's going to be in charge of uh, Great Britain. We've got FDR, you guys know him. Remember, he was the leader from uh, basically 1932. Uh, he takes office after Herbert Hoover sort of messes up dealing with the Depression. And he's actually going to serve until 1945. He dies uh, shortly before the war ends. Remember, uh, Truman finishes out the war. He's the one who actually orders the atomic bomb dropping on uh, Japan. Next thing I have right here, that is uh, Joseph Stalin, leader of the Soviet Union. And then this guy right here is Charles de Gaulle. He's going to be the um, basically in charge of uh, the resistance movement in France. And so uh, he is not technically a president at the time because Hitler has invaded and taken over France, but he's sort of the resistance leader. And then once the war ends, he will lead uh, France for like over 20 years. The people in France loved him. Uh, this guy right here, uh, that is the military leader of Japan. That is Hideki Tojo. I uh, remember that Japan had an emperor as well, a guy named Hirohito. But uh, we're dealing with a war and he was calling all the shots. So uh, then we've got um, Hitler right here. And then, of course, this fun-loving guy right here, you can tell by his face, uh, is Benito Mussolini. He's the guy who's in charge of uh, Italy, and he brings in sort of the fascist movement into Italy. Um, all right, let's go into the role of the United States in the war. That's sort of the end of this, okay? All right, so I've got a slide right here, and it says the United States neutral with an ex with a um, question mark. And so basically what we know is that the United States was never truly neutral. We sold weapons to our allies basically from day one of World War I. Um, FDR comes up with this idea that he calls the Lend-Lease Act, and he gets that passed through Congress. It authorized him to sell weapons to the British, to the French, you know, and Basically, we look at the Lindley's Act as a blank check. We were sending off any guns, you know, any uh, supplies, food, medical supplies, anything that our allies needed, we gave to them. Uh, basically, at no cost up front. We just said, if you need it, we've got it. Um, and it's yours. Um, and so the Lend-Lease Act, yes, we did expect them to pay us back a little bit later, uh, but it, you know they never paid us back completely, I would say. They, it was all about just sort of helping our allies and making sure that uh, Hitler and the Germans didn't take over all of Europe because it was basically cheaper for us to give them the stuff and hope that they could win than it would be for us for them to lose and then us have to fight all on our own. So that's a, one way to look at it. Um, so, let's go to the next part. Um, the next slide right here basically has a quote from FDR where he's sort of explaining his views on the Lend-Lease Act. It's kind of long, you don't have it in your notes, but I'm going to read this to you and I want to talk about it for just a minute, okay? So, looking at this, uh, this is Roosevelt's reasoning. So it says, suppose my neighbor's home catches fire and I have a length of garden hose four or 500 feet away. If he can take my garden hose and connect it up with his hydrant, I may help him to put out his fire. Now what do I do? I don't say to him before that operation, neighbor, my garden hose cost me $15. You have to pay me $15 for it. What is the transaction that goes on? I don't want $15. I want my garden hose back after the fire is over. All right, if it goes through the fire, all right, intact without any damage to it, he gives it back to me and thanks me very much for the use of it. But suppose it gets smashed up, holes in it during the fire. We don't have too much formality about it, but I say to him, I was glad to lend you that hose. I see I can't use it anymore. It's all smashed up, he says. How many feet of it were there, I tell him. There were 150 feet of it. He says, all right, I will replace it. Now, if I get a nice garden hose back, I am in pretty good shape. And so basically, Roosevelt saw the Lend-Lease Act as being a good friend, being a good neighbor. We were helping our allies in their time of need. And we were going to say, if you can pay us back later, that's fantastic. But you know, if you can't pay us now, that's OK, too. Um, and you know, it was all about sort of just helping our allies, OK? But that's what drags us into the war, guys. We were technically neutral, but we were still, you know, involved. And you know, a lot of times we were claiming, oh, the you know the Japanese they attacked us for no reason, but that's not really true. We weren't truly completely out of the war. All right. Last thing we got to talk about today is the attack on Pearl Harbor. 
okay? So, um, we know that this is one of the most important dates with World War II because this is the day that gets us into the war. So, December 7th, 1941, you have to know that date. You're going to have a quiz Friday, and you have to know it. It's a day which will live in infamy, and of course, FDR is the one who coined that term uh, in his speech that he gives on December 8th, where he officially declares war on Japan, Italy, and Germany. And basically, Pearl Harbor is a military or naval base in Hawaii where the U.S. had been, uh, you know, we were using it as sort of a place to re-supply uh, ships to put oil in them and get them ready to go out. And the Japanese knew that if they had attacked Pearl Harbor, once the U.S. was entered into World War II, that would make it easier, or I'm sorry, harder for us to have anything to do with Japan, to attack them in the Pacific. So they specifically tar targeted Pearl Harbor for that reason. Um, we got lucky with Pearl Harbor. Yes, a lot of people died, but our aircraft carriers could have been at Pearl Harbor. I think they were actually supposed to be at Pearl Harbor, but they survived through the attack. They were out on the open ocean. Uh, they had been moved just a couple of days before that. And remember, aircraft carriers, those are the ones that you can launch planes from. And so if those had been destroyed, um, then the United States wouldn't have been as at a good of a place to sort of attack Japan after um, they attacked us. But we were, you know, our Navy was hurt, but it wasn't completely crippled like it would have been if those had been destroyed. Um, so that's the official start of the U.S. getting into the war, and that's where we stop today in class. One of the only other thing I need you to know about Pearl Harbor is that today Pearl Harbor is considered like a monument. Um, it's like a national, almost like a national burial ground in a way, because you know those men who were were in those ships. Um, that died, a lot of them were left under the water. They couldn't get to them. And one of the biggest ships that was destroyed was this one called the USS Arizona. And they actually built a memorial um, where they have all of the men listed, uh, you know, who were killed in Pearl Harbor, and you can still go there today. Um, so if you are in my six period class, make sure you have watched this video. Make sure you have followed along and highlighted and wrote down the things that I wrote down on the screen. Make sure that you are ready to take that quiz on Friday.